Hello, ABF Online. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. So good to be with you today. Before we get into God's Word, and I know that's the reason why you're here, just wanted to give a couple of brief announcements. The first thing is this. Man, we know you're joining us from lots of different places. Maybe you're traveling this weekend and are not going to be in Agora Hills, and so you're checking us out online. That's amazing. Maybe you live somewhere else around the country or world, and you are tuning in because you know that Pastor Scott brings the heat when he gets into God's Word. That's amazing. Our just hope and prayer uh, as we know that it's so important for every believer to be connected to a local body, a local church. And so our prayer is, man, find and where is that spot where you're connecting with other believers in real life that can pour into your life uh, and be a part of the church. So that's our first thing in our heart for everyone. A couple of things that we'd like to point you to, regardless of where you're at, we'd love to pray for you this week. Amazing that our Lord bends down to listen to the requests that we bring before him. And so we'd love to pray for you. You can text any prayer request that you have to 97,000. Again, that's 97,000. Text us and we will pray for you almost immediately. We'd love to do that. There are a bunch of things going on here in Agora Hills. If you are local and interested in all the events, activities, ministries that are going on here at the church, check out the website, agorabible.org, or download the app, our church center app. Uh, lots of things going on, and you can figure all that out there on the website. Lastly, our ongoing ministries here at ABF are only possible through generous financial support. And so we are so thankful for so many generous people that keep the ministries here at ABF going. And so if you are interested in uh, continuing to support ABF, you can do that online on the website as well under the Give tab. Thank you so much uh, for even prayerfully considering it. We are super, super grateful. Well, without further ado, shall we get into the Word of God? Well, thanks, Josh, and uh, welcome, church family, to another online service. And you might be looking and uh, just wondering where we're at. We're actually in the middle of Camp ABF here, and I'm uh, actually broadcasting this week from Planet Zuzu. Uh, so pretty, pretty fun uh, week that we've had thus far, just, uh, just seeing so many kids' uh, lives impacted and so many great volunteers, kind of the church coming together to have an impact. And so excited to spend some time with you now and uh, God's Word, but did want to give you a a little bit of a, a heads up for those of you that maybe didn't catch this uh, mentioned. Uh, you won't see me as the teaching pastor uh, for a little while. The church, as, a, uh, as a, a blessing to myself and our family, is actually after 10 years of ministry offering uh, a sabbatical season. So July and uh, August, I'm going to be away. And so you'll see a plethora of great speakers, including Josh and Chris and John, and uh, even Chad will be up. So really looking forward to uh, catching up on some of those uh, teachings this summer. But uh, grateful for the opportunity to get away. But I want to, before I go, just spend some time, final time, just finishing up this series uh, entitled Powerful Prayers. Hopefully you've uh, been blessed by this series like I know I have been. And uh, just thinking through just some of the different uh, interactions with God that we've seen, even God doing the miraculous uh, last week in the uh, life of this father and son uh, combo, and just story after story of God responding to prayer. But if we're honest about prayer and requests, one of the challenging things, at least it is for me, just thinking through uh, prayer and how it works, how that relationship works with our God, is uh, we're actually submitting requests, but then we're left a little bit to wonder, how is God going to respond? Is it going to be a yes? Is it going to be a, a no? Is it going to be a later? Uh, a lot of times we just don't know what to expect in prayer, but here's the interesting thing about the prayer that we're going to highlight this week. The prayer that we're going to focus on this week actually has a promised result, a guaranteed response from God when we pray this prayer. And it's kind of a, be a cool study in that uh, concept this week. And we'll actually have at the end of our uh, time together an opportunity for every single person uh, watching this uh, video to actually pray the prayer that I'm re referring to today. Basically, it's a prayer that has the potential to redirect, and it's kind of interesting to think that of this, to redirect our eternity. 
And I know uh, some people that are around the church for a while uh, give me a hard time because that's a, a phrase or expression I u- use uh, fairly often, but it's very relevant in today's passage. We're going to be looking at Romans 10 and uh, verses uh, uh, 1 through 13. And, but before we do that, I think it's important for us to understand why I would say eternity redirecting. Where are we being redirected from? Let me just give you a, a brief, somewhat a concise uh, overview of our situation, our circumstance, or you might even say uh, the predicament that we're in. First thing to understand, and I, this has an order to it. You can see it on the slide there. This has an order to it. First thing to understand that every single one of us, as Romans Genesis 1 explains, was created in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. We're included in that, and Scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He designed us perfectly with intent, with purpose, and designed us to be in relationship with him. We then learn in Romans 14, 12, that at the end of our days, every single one of us, it says this, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So first thing, we were created by God, and then also we're to give an account to God for our actions and choices here in life. So it's not like we're just running around and no accountability like uh, uh, kids when the parents leave home. Or this is, this is a, a God that we're going to answer to. And this is where the uh, intensity of the predicament uh, uh, escalates. Romans 3.23, you might be familiar with this. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, the idea is that every single one of us falls short of God's perfect standard as outlined. Even his basic principles or uh, commands to us in the Ten Commandments. Every single one of us falls short of those standards. So, because of that, and here's where it gets more intense. It says in Romans 6.23 that that choice to sin and go our own way. It says, for the wages of sin is death. In other words, our choice to go our own direction actually yields a result. It actually has a a, a wage that we earn in that, and the wage is death. And that death described there, the original term, is talking both about physical and spiritual death. And here's the intense part in 2 Thessalonians is where death takes us. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 explains where we're headed when we die because of our sin. It says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Notice a few things there, a couple intense aspects. First is the word eternal there. It describes eternal punishment or destruction. It's kind of a a mind-boggling thing that there's a, a billion years that will pass on the other side of this life and will still exist in that or headed towards an eternity there because of our sin, because of our willful rebellion. Another thing to catch in that description of that last verse, though, is we're told that we will be away from the presence of the Lord. See, a lot of times people give a hard time to to God for saying, well, how can a loving God send somebody to hell? But if you actually think through what's taking place, is he's just honoring their choice to say, I want nothing to do with you. So, He allows that. He says, all right, if you want nothing to do with me, that's where you will spend eternity. It's just our minds can't fathom the horror of eternity separated from God. What does that look like? Absence from his love, absence from his kindness, all of those things. This is a serious predicament, but it's not one, thankfully, that we have to be stuck in. It's not a situation that there's not a rescue opportunity. And that's what we're going to spend and focus our attention on today. A prayer that literally can redirect, change our eternity. Let me pray before we look at that. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this chance to gather around your word. And really today, just such a, a critical message 
And a lot of times, pastors, I know God will be given a hard time for hellfire and brimstone messages, but man, that is the gospel because there's so much at stake, so much riding on this choice of what we do with the free offer of Jesus Christ. I, my prayer and my hope is this would be something that sinks deep in the listener's heart, that this might even be a, a time where a person makes the choice to bend a knee and call out to you for rescue, God. We ask that you'd be present in this time of teaching. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so starting in Romans chapter 9, uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul. He's describing, he's talking about this situation, and he starts by explaining some of the things that don't rescue us before he gets to what actually does. It says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I already described what we're being saved from. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. All right, pause. Who are we talking to? What's he talking about? Again, this is Paul, the, one of the early church leaders. He's describing his broken heart for his fellow Jewish believers that have rejected the provision of Jesus Christ. You can see a, a few things as he laments their unbelief. The first thing is that he describes that he's praying for them to be saved. It's a good reminder that in his mindset and what is an appropriate understanding as nobody until they breathe their last breath is on the outside of God's pursuit that they can't be rescued. So it's not too late. Maybe some of us watching this or listening right now that is saying to themselves, man, I feel Paul's pain. I have people I care about deeply that you're just like, man, if they could just get it, if he could just break through to their heart. And that's why prayer is such an important piece, even on that side of the equation, pleading for God to rescue lost people. Here's the, the interesting thing, though, that he describes of the people that haven't embraced Christ. He points out they weren't lacking zeal. What do we mean by zeal? Another word for passion. Or, uh, that he's saying, man, it's not an issue of their lack of passion, but he says, but it's not according to knowledge. You often hear somebody say, oh man, but they're so sincere about their beliefs. But here's the problem. You can be sincere and zealous about your beliefs, but have your beliefs not rooted in truth and be completely off base. Not everything is an accurate version or option for rescue. Basically, zeal is pointless if it's not grounded in the truth. If you think about it, ISIS rebels are very zealous about what they believe. And Paul himself is somebody, as he's speaking from experience, he comes from a background of being zealous about the wrong things. He says, not according to knowledge. Really, for the audience of that day, they'd be surprised by Paul making that statement of anything. His Jewish brothers and sisters would be known for their unbelievable knowledge and understanding of Scripture up until that point. They had what was called the Talmud, which would be similar in size to the Encyclopedia Britannica in length. Basically, it was a compilation of the oral and rabbinic commentary on Scripture a lot of times the, the a common Jew would have so much of the Old Testament even committed to memory. There would even be some that would have the entire Old Testament at this point memorized. So it's not what you'd think what we often associate with knowledge, not lacking knowledge as an in information. But here's the reality is spiritual knowledge looks very different and explains where the confusion lies. It says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Basically, what they've done is they've come up with their own version of God's righteousness, kind of on a sliding scale. They've made the mistake of thinking God is much more tolerant than he is. We still present day do that, if you think about it. A lot of people, if you ask them, well, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they'd say, well, 
I've been a, a, a good person my whole life. I think my chances are good. Well, you see, their, their, their perspective, that person's perspective, much like his Jewish brother and sister's perspective of God's law and his righteousness, is way off base. You see, they don't understand the perfect standard that God has set, that nobody on this planet will ever meet his perfect standard. And it's almost a, a comical attempt to do so. We prefer a lesser God that will be tolerant to our shortcomings, but his standard for righteousness is perfection. He says they're not willing to submit to God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness in this scenario? They're depending on their righteousness and you're not submitting to his righteousness. His righteousness was the provision of his perfect and blameless son as a sacrifice for our shortcomings. That's his provision. He's like, you won't submit, you won't bend a knee. So you're rooted in a false understanding. So the first thing for us to understand in this text is that zeal does not redirect eternities. It doesn't matter how passionate we are about something if it's not rooted in the provision of Jesus Christ. Continue in verse four. It says, for Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, and the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say to your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Basically, here's what he's explaining. Well, maybe a better way to uh, make sense out of this. I don't know if what you, where you land on some of kids' sporting events and where they've introduced, and it's been around for a long time, what they call participation trophies. This, uh, this idea that if you were there, if you made it to practice, you made it a game, doesn't matter what the results were, just by participating, you get a trophy. You see, that's not ex at all what it looks like. There's no participation trophies from God's perspective. He says, the person that does the commandments shall live by them. In other words, if you're choosing to try to achieve, to try to make it to God on your own, based on your own efforts, then the, the standard of the law is which you'll live by. But here's the problem with that. None of us can perfectly keep the law. We all fall short of the glory of God is what scripture reminds us. And here's the other option, the alternative. Well, those who embrace Christ, it's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does he mean it's the end of the law? Does that mean just now after you believe, it's just a complete free for all? No, it's saying the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, in order to attain righteousness, the law is no longer an option for you. That's not the route to get there. It's not the means to be seen righteous before God. Still need to be seen righteous before him, but it's not going to happen through the law. That's an impossible thing based on human effort. Instead, it's righteousness based on faith alone. Again, I like how Paul explains it in Philippians, his understanding of this from somebody that has a background of human effort. He says, Philippians 3, 8 through 9 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, seeing him as that. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or trash in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And this is an important part I wanted to highlight. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, basically, this is the idea. You've got to come to the conclusion that I can't do it. It can't be based on my merit. You need to put your resume, your good works resume back in its file because that is never going to cut it before God. It doesn't matter what level of effort you put in, it's not going to get you, not going to get you there. So 
The question you might have at this point is, uh, if, if zeal doesn't get me there, if effort doesn't get me there, what actually provides my rescue? And I'm glad you asked. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. All right, this is such a critical couple verses in Scripture. I want to take a few moments to just explore that. First thing to understand he's describing, he's saying the, the truth is near you. In, in other words, it's already been clearly revealed. It's right under your nose. I don't know if you remember playing this as a kid or with your kids, but the game where it was called Hot or Colder, where you're trying to help somebody find where something is missing is at, and you know exactly where it's been placed. And as they get closer, you're just like, all right, you're getting cool. You're getting hotter, getting hotter. As they get, as take a step away in the wrong direction, you're like getting cooler, getting cooler, cold. And as they get really close, you're like hot, 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 white hot. And that's a, a, a tool for getting it. And I, I was thinking about that. I'm like, that's exactly where his audience finds himself. They are white hot with the truth right in front of them. They've had it exposed to them. It's right within sight. It's described here as in their mouth and in their heart basically both being needed to be impacted in order to have your eternity redirected, both your heart and your mouth. He says this in verse nine, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Basically, it's responding. The first thing to understand is those simple two words, if you if you, do you see the, the ownership that's re, that we're responsible for? Really, this isn't something that you stumble upon. It's not something that you accidentally fall into. It's a decision. It's a, a cognitive choice that we make in our lifetime, in our 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this planet to either accept or reject. There's an if you component to it. If you is the explanation. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So what is this uh, belief thing? What is this confession thing? First, belief, I think an appropriate understanding of that is important, is an active trust, ju not just intellectual assent. That's an important understanding to have. It's not just a, oh, I, I, uh, I acknowledge this intellectually. It's something that you assent to. You're, you're like turning over to something that you believe. I was uh, listening to a talk sometime back by Francis Chan, and he was telling a story of back when he was a youth group. He's like, some of the ideas that he had tried and things that worked and things that are like, ah, that was not such a good idea. He had in one illustration, he had a, a balloon on one side of the stage he was talking about. And on the other side, he had a, a, a BB gun. First off, any sermon that has a, a, a gun involved, probably not a good idea. And he's like, all right, how many of you here, he's talking to a group of students, how many of you here believe that I can shoot this balloon and hit it with a BB gun? And it was a high percentage of the room thought it was possible because it wasn't very far away. He had the, it right in his sights. And he said, all right, now which student is willing to come up here, put the balloon in your mouth, stand sideways, and then demonstrate whether you believe that I can hit, successfully hit the balloon? All of a sudden, the list of students that were willing to express their faith in his shooting ability went back down dramatically. But then he tells the story, one kid was willing to do it. And he said, oh, it went against all of his better discernment and whether or not to implement this idea. But the kid came on stage and he said, I shot the balloon. And so he's, he's like, man, those are stories of things that could have gone terribly wrong. But I think it's a, a, a perfect picture of understanding what, is, what does belief look like? It's an active trust. It's not just intellectual. It's, a, it's a, something that's an inner, inner conviction that somebody has or belief about something. 
because we, we're told that even the demons believe and tremble. So it's not an issue of understanding. It's an issue of whether you're turning your life over to something or not. Confession, by definition, is a public expression of an inner conviction. But what are we actually believing or confessing? It tells us two things here specifically. One, it says, confess him as Lord. Not just a generic Lord of the universe, but a personal ruling Lord to whom I submit. As I mentioned, James 2.19 tells us that the demons believe, but they're not submitting to his lordship. Often there's a lot of confusion about what this lordship looks like. We think about salvation and we don't necessarily attach that. But if you look and do some studies on salvation in the New Testament, it mentions Jesus as Savior 10 times and it mentions him as Lord 700 times in the New Testament. See, Lord influences the way you think and make decisions. If you think about that, if you claim that somebody was the Lord in your life, all of a sudden there would be a, a, a close connection. You'd be very careful to do what their, what their preferences are, to obey them, to be seeking their will in your life. If someone's truly your Lord, it looks very different. But the truth is, studies that have shown, uh, one that I was reading and looking at this week is Barna reports that actually in the typical believer's life, there's very little difference between them and the people around them that don't profess Jesus as Lord. That's a sad reality. It's a scary truth. But here's the thing to understand. I think it's a misunderstanding of what this confessing, what this making him as Lord actually is. We tend to think, I was reading also this week, uh, a, a, a study that was done by Greg Boyd that was pointing out how we in the American culture, we typically t think in terms of contracts. What do I mean by contracts? It's a modern era, something that we use between two parties to acquire something, to kind of guarantee something, whether it's your house or your car. Think about the contract. You're like, okay, for th this exchange of this resource, for this, this is the agreed upon amount, and that's what, the, uh, that's, that's what you walk away with. And you really look in a contract to get away with uh, as little given for as much received. We're always looking for a deal and a contract. But here's what's happening. When you're confessing him as Lord, it's not in the sense of a contract. It's in the sense of a covenant. In scripture, what a covenant was, was a lifelong commitment between both parties. If you think about it in terms of a covenant in a, a marriage scenario, what do, we, what do you say? Till death, do us part. It's relational. In a contract, you're looking for loopholes and what I can get away with. How much can I, uh, what, what can I do without revoking and messing up the contract? In a, in a covenant, it's a relationship. It's a, it's a reciprocal. It's both parties are fully in. Here's the thing to understand. Is that Jesus's work on the cross is actually a marriage proposal. We don't, we don't say I do to a, a, a marriage relationship to enter into a contract. That would be belittling what's happening there. If you think about it, it must actually break God's heart to see us treat him like he's a legal contract. What do I get out of it? What's the least that's expected of me when all he wants and desires is our heart? He wants relationships. So when we actually confess him as Lord, we're starting with a commitment to his lordship. So what else are we believing in? We're told also in the same verse that we're to believe that God raised him from the dead. This is the ultimate validation of his deity. It's not, it's not, you're, we're not dealing with a, a, just a good teacher or a prophet, but literally God in the flesh. You heard me say God in an earth suit often from this stage. We serve a, a risen Lord, not a dead prophet. That's why our future hope hinges on him because he's had victory over death. He's conquered sin. He provides a way of rescue. And this is the way of rescue. It's two things. It's confessing and believing. And here's the amazing news found in verse 11. 
It says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Such a a beautiful promise. I mentioned that promise at the beginning of our talk that's actually a prayer that has a guaranteed result, that you will be saved. I'll share a a story that maybe you're not familiar with with me. One of the things behind the scenes that I do, I'm maybe a little embarrassed to mention it. My wife gives me a hard time. But for years and years, they have this thing called the HGTV Home Giveaway. They've been doing it for such a long time. And during their giveaway stretches, they give away a house, a car, and usually uh, some level of cash. And they have uh, two free opportunities every single day to register for a chance to win for this. So most days when I start my day, when I first kind of check the phone, checking emails, I'll go on that website. I have a little reminder and click two free entries to win this house. I've been doing it for years. And every single time when they announce the winner, guess who it is? Not me. It's never me. It's out of the the millions of people, it's never ever me winning this crazy contest. And yet I still continue it to this day when I have the opportunity. Yes, you can tease me about it later, but here's the thing that I love about this offer that's on the table, the rescue plan, the riches, the glory, all that Jesus offers because because of his finished work on the cross, everyone is invited Everyone, he makes it crystal clear. Everyone wins who believes. Out of the millions of participants on this planet, every single one of them is a winner. That's why it says everyone, all. It's an inclusive offer. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your social status, your family origin. It doesn't matter your uh, economic status, anything. He's like, whoever calls on him for rescue, whoever prays this prayer, commits to making him Lord, believes in your heart, where it's a a connect between mind and heart. It's like whoever makes that choice, what does he say? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is the rescue offer to everyone who chooses to embrace it. But here's the thing to understand is it is the only offer that's on the table. A lot of times people are confused in that. Well, aren't there lots of different options? Scriptural, scripture is crystal clear about this. John 14, 6, Jesus himself said, uh, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 14, 12. And, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the last one, sealing deal, John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So my friends, this is where I want to bring us to the opportunity as we consider this. Just wrestling through, where are you at with this offer? Have you ever called out, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? It's just not saying Jesus will be my Lord. It's acknowledging him as the Lord, the Lord over all. But when he's the Lord over all, it actually means over your life as well. Is he someone that you've bent a knee to before? And here's the amazing thing. This is what I mentioned. This has got a guaranteed promised response to this prayer. If we believe that in our heart, if we believe that God came down, lived a perfect life, died on a cruel Roman cross as a substitute for our sins, rose again on the third day, was raptured up to heaven, is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. If we believe that, if we actually are willing to put our trust in that, man, you can confess that even in these moments as I'm speaking. 
I want to give us just a, a, a moment even to do that. As you're watching this online and you're like, that seems weird to actually uh, do that while I'm just watching this, this video here. But that's the offer that's on the table that you can actually profess that in these moments. You can say out loud even now if you believe it in your heart. You can say, Jesus is Lord. And what we're promised in scripture is that this will redirect your eternity. For the person that's maybe says, man, I made that decision a long time this time ago. This might be the perfect opportunity for you to come back and be like, man, I, I profess that, but I am not living that. I want to align my actions with my claim belief. Again, an opportunity just as I wrap up in prayer for both parties. Lord Jesus, we thank you again just for this chance to slow down and be in your word. For us to recognize what's actually at stake here, that literally our, our eternity hinges on this choice. What we do is it gonna be based on being zealous and passionate about all the wrong things? Is it gonna be based on human effort, and my resume of good works? Or will I humbly admit, I can't do it on my own. I can't meet God's perfect standard, but man, I am sure thankful that Jesus has and I embrace him as Savior and Lord. Even as I'm praying now, I hope that there's a person listening that makes that choice, God. We're told in scripture that there's a celebration in heaven when that happens. And so God, I ask that you'd move, that you'd pursue, that you'd make yourself irresistible in the listener's mind and heart, even as I speak. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen.